First, I want to talk about these states here, Flushing Meadow, Flushing Meadow Corona Park, and what it's been and how it's changed over the last 350 years. And the first European settlers came here, and they were the Dutch. They found this land here, and it was what we, in my childhood, would have called a swamp, but we more politely called them that land is now. And it was pretty much impenetrable. There was the flushing, if you look at old maps from the 17th century and the 18th century, you will see the, what we now call a flushing creek or the flushing river, which we will see, where you can see it. It's not, here it's buried. But then it was open, it was not really navigable, but it's kind of snaked through the land, pretty much going up to where the expressway is. And it wasn't really navigable, but it was surrounded by what we call the salt marsh. And the salt marsh, we have come to recognize, is the, at this in mid-latitude levels, is the most productive environment for photosynthesis. The salt marsh, pretty much every sea creature around here spends part of its life in the salt marsh. Those are the insects and the crustaceans and the birds that feed on the insects and the crustaceans. And it grows as these, uh, now we've got these phragmates, phragmates and we have cattails and spartina grass. And that stuff is very hardy and it just takes in a lot of sunshine and produces a lot of food for all these other things that grow here in the soil. Please feel free to come and you guys too, because I don't know. Uh, so that's what it was like uh, when the Dutch first came in here. The Dutch, of course, founded their um, first site in New York City at the tip of Manhattan Island, that, that they called New Amsterdam. In Battery Park was a place where Peter Mindy went, with a little sign, so you may, may have seen it, where he made the deal with the Indians for the mythical $24. <coughs> And the Dutch founded their first settlement. Battery Park, by the way, is landfill. So the site where that where that uh, uh, plaque is would have been kind of in the same kind of environment that this was 350 years ago. It wasn't land. Battery Park wasn't created until the late 19th century when they filled in the land, as what happened here. Okay. So that's the first. The Dutch settled there at the tip of Manhattan. And that's a perfect location for commerce because the rivers kind of come together with the harbor, the Hudson, and the East River, and the Harbor, harbor everything. And it's a protected harbor. It's a terrific site for a, a fort and a place of commerce. But it wasn't a good place for, agri for agriculture because eventually they wanted to grow their own food. Otherwise, they have to have their food shipped in from Holland or an Indian's razor or something like that. So they went on a search to find other places where they could grow food. And the search included, the only way they got around in those days was by sailboats. Sailboats depend on knowledge of the tides and knowledge of the winds. So they went, they, they sailed up what we call the tidal creeks in the New York area. Kiwanis Creek, Newtown Creek, Flushing Creek, and Westchester Creek, Creek in the Bronx. And they went up these tidal creeks, which are not really rivers because they don't really have a source. They just slosh back and forth with the tides. So if you know your tides and your winds, you can move in these tidal creeks with the tides and the winds much more than sailing up a river. They, they were good sailors. That's the way they got around. And you know, they say, oh, it's windy today. We can go up this one or go down that one. So that's how they got around. And they explored each of these four creeks. And the only creek that was actually good for agriculture was Flushing Creek. And that's because when you go up Flushing Creek, and that's where we'll see the Willis Point area, it means when you look east towards Flushing, the land rises. And you need it to rise as land, because if the creek ends in a swamp, you really can't do any agriculture there, or you're, you've got flooding, and you also, if you haven't made friends with the Indians yet, then you can't really see if they're coming. <laughs> Flushing Creek was the most important one in terms of agriculture. East, east, the east of the creek in Flushing, and you'll see what I'm talking about, the land rises and it leads to fertile land, and in fact, the first nurseries in North America were in Flushing. 
in the colonial per period, and some of the best, best farming in Queens was in Flushing also. So Flushing starts off as an important agricultural community, and its first industry is super agriculture or horticulture. And the first nurseries are the horticulture, growing plants so that other people can use those plants in, you know, for their garden ornamentation or for uh, productive uh, purposes. So Flushing Creek was the only creek that led to fertile land, so that became rather important. And that's the situation. Nobody really penetrated this um, harassed swamp or, or, or wetlands here, but they flew down, they went down Flushing Creek. And in fact, of the Dutch towns that were set up, Flushing Town, which was originally called Vlissingen, after a coastal town in Holland. Can you spell that? Vlissingen, B-L-I-S-S-I-N-E-N. It's a coast, it's still on the map, it's near the Belgian border, it's where ships left in Holland for the New World. So the boundaries of Vlissingen were on the north shore from approximately Little Neck Bay to Flushing Bay, and, south, and north of Union Turnpike today. Whereas Middleburg, which later became Newtown, which later became Elmhurst, was to the west of Flushing Creek and included this morass here. This, this water, this, in Flushing, you didn't have a swamp because you went there. Here you have the, the wetlands and it's part of the town. What was that called? What was that called? Middleburg was Middleburg. the first name. That was the Dutch name because Middleburg, like Lissingen, was a, was a, was a uh, waterfront community and ships left from there, from there as well. So that's this area under the Dutch. There's Flushing Town, which is already being, by, 18, by the 18, by the 1650s, is already uh, experiencing agricultural colonies. And then there's Middleburg, later to become Newtown, when the British take over, where the tennis area is uh, swamped or whatever. Changes don't really appear until post-colonial periods. In the 1830s, the first bridge was built over the Flushing Creek from Flushing, approximately in the vicinity of what we call Northern Boulevard now. And that was built by William Prince, who also built the first nurseries in Flushing, the Prince Nurseries. And if you know Flushing area, there's Prince Street. And Prince Street was named for William Prince and his sons who uh, built the first nurseries of Flushing. There are other streets, Parsons Boulevard and Murray Street, which are also uh, named for nursery Flushing. So there's the first penetration of this area. That's in the 1830s. In the 1850s, the Flushing and North Shore Railroad was built. Railroads, Long Island Railroad was already in business in Jamaica and Brooklyn, and the Harlem Railroad was in business in Manhattan, Lower Manhattan, Upper Manhattan. The first railroad around here was in the 1850s, and it connected Flushing to Long Island City. Because already both Brooklyn and Manhattan were rebelling against <coughs> industry in their midst, and Long Island, the Long Island City area wasn't called Long Island City yet. Eh, nobody was in control, and they figured, eh, we can go there and, and build industry and whatever. We needed a railroad to connect it to Flushing where a lot of stuff was happening, there was a lot of market gardening here, and uh, take it to Long Island City from whence you can take it by ferry into Manhattan. So that situation existed for a number of years. So now you have a railroad coming through this area, and that's pretty much the same site as the Long Island Railroad is here. If you, I mean, if you came from the subway station, you crossed over the Long Island Railroad just before you got over the bridge into the park. Well, not where it was here in the 1850s, and that began to change things. The community we now call Corona, which is on this side of the park, was first called West Flushing. But then the real estate people kind of got a hold of it and said, this does not sound terribly, ter terribly appealing. So they gave it a much more glamorous name called Corona. And Corona, you know, Corona has you know Corona Avenue, you know Corona Avenue, Corona. That is the old country road, originally called Flushing Avenue, that went all the way from Colonial to Colonial Flushing. Avenue was a piece of that. It was 
was Flushing Avenue in Brooklyn, and now Grand Avenue in Maspeth and Elmhurst, and then Corona Avenue in Corona, and then College Point Boulevard in Flushing. So that's the old connection between Brooklyn and, and Flushing. Uh, Where did that start in Brooklyn? I'm sorry? Where did that old road originate in Brooklyn? Somewhere near the Navy. Uh, wherever you see Flushing Avenue, where Flushing yeah, Avenue starts, it's pretty much the old, it's near, near the Navy Yard, so <laughs> but it doesn't quite go with the downtown. But it did connect downtown Brooklyn to Flushing. Just like Flatbush Avenue connected downtown Brooklyn to Flatbush. So there were a number of colonial roads, but really the easier way to get around was by boat. So the railroad comes in, makes that connection, Corona is built, um, <laughs> Corona Avenue becomes upgraded, and the properties in Corona start dumping. People who are living here, the agricultural people, the manure, things get dumped here in Flushing, what is now Flushing Meadow Park. It's still a wetland in the swamp, and in those days, people keep up with respect for wetlands. Okay, that takes us through the middle of the 19th century. By the end of the 19th century, industry becomes more and more important, both in Flushing along Flushing Creek and, and in Corona along the Long Island Railroad. So that creates industry. In, industry tends to make a mess. A lot of that mess goes right into this weapons. No environmental movements, movements uh, generated at that point. takes us to the end of the 19th century, pretty much. And the end of the 19th, by the end of the 19th century, Brooklyn is a big city. Queens is not. Queens consists of the separate towns, and one little, relatively small city called Long Island City, started in 1874. But by the mid-1890s, Brooklyn had consolidated all of its towns into the city of Brooklyn. In 1898, we have the big consolidation of Greater New York and all of Brooklyn, Johnson, Queens towns that we recognize now jump in also the eastern towns with Nassau County. But even in the 1890s, Brooklyn was generating a lot of waste, primarily coal ash. But people used coal to heat their homes, and that generated ash. And they needed some place to dump that ash. They were using an island in Jamaica Bay until, that, until the capacity was reached in that island. And then in the early 19th and early 20th century, when the city is now consolidated, Brooklyn buys land from Queens here in what is now Flushing Meadow Park, and it becomes the Corona Dumps. And all the, if you're familiar with F. Scott Fitzgerald's story, The Great Gatsby, and The Great Gatsby, the Nick Carraway character is riding on the railroad through the Valley of Ashes, huge mounds of ashes that are here in probably New York's biggest eyesore. And to Will's point, it's, it's still probably one of the biggest eyesores in the city. And that was a terrible thing to see. Robert Moses, with his eye on economic development and transportation development, saw this as an opportunity to get rid of the corona dumps and create a big park here. And an, an impetus to form that park would be the World's Fair here when the park was finished. The first World's Fair in Flushing Meadow Park. The park was created in the 30s, and the, in 1939, we've been celebrating in Queens the 50th and 75th anniversary of that fair all year. And we'll be doing it this year too because it went into 1940. We'll be celebrating <laughs> that one. Uh, so, the World's Fair opens here in 1939, and the Corona dumps have been turned into a park. Flushing River is, a, is a, basically a sewer system, and the lakes, Willow Lake and um, Meadow Lake, on the other side of the expressway, one of them is turned into an aqua cage by Billy Rose, and another one is just there as a lake. That is dammed up harsh portions of the, of the, of the former Flushing Creek and Flushing River. Where the, with the rest of it kind of funneled on the ground up until Roosevelt Avenue, which where, where, we, where we will approach Willow's Point. And at that point, there was a floodgate so that sewage and storm waters from Flushing Bay would not channel back into the park. So the park 
dealt with relatively clean water, and the boundary was World War II. And this was so that we're So that's 1939 and 1940, and very little is left of the 39 fair in this part. Primarily, this building. This building was the uh, city building, New York City's exhibit. And the exhibits in this building were primarily showing off New York's I've already talked to people who work for various city agencies, showing off New York City's agencies, but with per particularly the police department and the fire department and I don't know what the water department was, and it wasn't called the Department of Environmental Protection. They just reopened the relief map. Hmm? Uh, the relief map and the, just opened right. and the just relief reopened map, yesterday. The relief map that's here in the museum was at that, was part of that exhibit. It and wasn't. Now it's been back. We, we learned yesterday that it wasn't actually. It was built for that exhibit, but um, the, the DEP guys yesterday told us that since it was on the eve of war, they decided not to display it, and it actually didn't wasn't displayed to the public until the Jubilee in 1948. Yeah, that's so, when I was born in '43, and my mother used to feed me in, in the bathroom, <laughs> which had a, like a skylight. It was the one place that we didn't have to turn on a light <laughs> because everybody was afraid of. German spy spy plant. Those days are gone. Yeah, but now so so they is. so they built this beautiful topographical map that you can see in the other room now for the 1939 World's Fair, showing off New York City's water system, and then in 1939 decided that they didn't really want to show off New York City's water system right at that moment. <laughs> Maybe there was a better moment. <laughs> so after the after the fair, Moses won. Moses won the term. Flushing Meadow Park into a campus for the army. This in Geneva, if you've ever been to the former group of nations, it was a campus like kind of affair. And Moses didn't get beaten too much. If he liked an idea, he usually got it through. But he was up against Rockefeller for this one. And Rockefeller and Zeckendorf. Rockefeller bought the land from Zeckendorf on, on Turtle Bay, the present site of the UN, and they built it more than there. And Moses lost that one. But ironically, the real uh, United Nations is all around the part. This is the, probably the most immigrant-intensive part of the whole city. And it's just ironic. And they all play in this part. And so many, the, the new immigrants in this park, the old European immigrants usually have their parade or annual get-together somewhere in Manhattan. The new immigrants usually use this park or streets and Queens for their parades and their events. So that's one of the roles of Flushing Middle Park is not playing. Um, this has also become a venue for sports. Uh, the tennis, ever since 1970, even Forrester's Gardens here to the park, and then they used what was called the, Louis, the Singer Bowl, which was renamed Louis Armstrong Stadium, and then they built a much larger uh, stadium, the Arthur Ashe Stadium, and the whole complex is now called the Billy Complex here in the park. I'm Jack, I'm going to interrupt you. We have one hour to get back here. Okay. <laughs> so, and I'm going to give you guys a little context. Going going. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, anybody it's is time it, to go. Um, so, I'm Paula Siegel. I'm the director of 596 Acres. This is the opening of RF5 Week Intervention here at the Queens Museum. It's called Reviewing Renewal. We are looking at the history and the present of urban renewal planning in New York City. Um, we've done an intervention on the panorama where we've actually marked all 155 oh, urban renewal <laughs> plans that the city has ever adopted. Um, 62 of those plans remain active today. And as we walk through the point today, we're actually bringing with us, maybe you can hold that up. We're bringing with us a life-size version of one of the markers from the panorama, where we'll take a picture of all of us, um, because Bullets well, Point is an active urban renewal plan area. It's actually the latest one that the city has adopted. It was adopted in 2008. Some people find that very surprising, right? We have a myth of urban renewal. It's something that happened in the past. It's something that you know Robert Moses did and then got done with. But that's actually absolutely not true. It's um, certainly Mr. Moses has a big hand in shaping how urban renewal was used by the city of New York, but not only did it continue to be used after he resigned from his role on the Committee of, on Slum Clearance, 
It continued to be used by the city of New York after 1974 when the federal government declared urban renewal a failure and stopped funding it. So we're spending five weeks looking at the connections between the neighborhoods that have been impacted by this kind of master planning and continue to be impacted. I got an email this morning from somebody in East New York, I hope they're here, who, oh, hi, Cassandra, um, who says, well, we think that we're gonna be targeted by a plan like this coming soon, so we'd like to know what other neighborhoods are experiencing and how people are reacting, and that's exactly the point of us doing this intervention. We have five Sundays of programming. We're gonna spend an hour in the cold. Everybody has hand warmers. We've got here late. Madrul has some for you. Um, we're going to come back here at 2 o'clock. We are screening the crew at Igo Mint upstairs. It is a great 65-minute documentary on the history of public housing, which parallels the history of urban renewal in this country. I invite you to join us for that. At 3.30, we'll begin programming in the panorama, and at 4 o'clock, we're having a reception. So please stay. Um, and bundle up, zip up all your zippers, button up all your buttons, and let's go. We're going to, I'm not going to stop in the park. We're going to just do a, a brisk walk to the subject of this walk. So this is your chance to meet somebody in this you group talk to somebody along that you've never met before. before. But I, I, I'm just going to do a brisk walk to where we want to begin. Okay. That's tomorrow. Sorry. I guess it might make sense for me to try to stay close to him. I will talk about that. There is a lawsuit. and some other stuff that's right here. And then if you come out in time, you can join the walk back. If you don't come out in time, you know which way to go, right? Just follow the Unisphere and you'll, you'll get there. <laughs> okay, we're going up. And that was built for the second World's Fair. For the first World's Fair, they built the Grand Central Parkway, two lanes on either side. Now it's four lanes, and it's in the process it lost all its landscaping. Ben Wick doesn't have any landscaping, it takes trucks. And beyond that, you see booming downtown Flushing. And all those buildings are at least 30 feet above sea level, because that goes up the bluff that's down to Flushing. Mostly condos, but some some malls and shopping centers, things are really booming there. There were two, in the last five years, two malls opened and two more are under construction.
Also, before other trains, number seven <laughs> comes to Corona in 1917, but it doesn't get the flushing until 1928. That's because they had to build the tunnel flushing, because the merchants are flushing too. You're not going to build an elevator train here in Philadelphia. I wondered about that. It just oh, goes yeah, because they already knew what happened to elevator trains. In other places, the elevator trains actually pushed into new territory where there weren't any trains. The flushing was already established for 300 years. be looking this way at me and behind me. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Behind me you see effectively what is now the end of Flushing Creek. Beyond that bridge there, there's a there's a tidal flood dam and the water cannot slosh back and forth behind that. It could if you had serious flooding, but that hasn't really happened yet. And after that spot, the whole thing is underground, channeled through sewers under the park. Out this way, it's hard to see, but I, don't, I wanted you to see this. Thank you. I wanted you to see this. Thank you. But if you ever get a chance to see the other side, you can see the river heading, or the creek heading up that way. I think it's incorrect to call this a river. You can call it a tidal creek. The water is, the most, the motion of the water is not one way as the rivers would be from the higher land to the lower land. All the land is at the same height, so the water is just sloshing back and forth with the tides or the winds. And that's the last gasp of Flushing Creek above land. The rest of it is in the sewer under the park. You can see the up, I can't really, I thought I could cross over here, but I can't. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to head back to the vegetation. When you get down to the level of the creek and, and the vegetation that you see up here, very different ecology. The uh, marsh grasses take over. was a street that was built pre-Civil War 
to connect Willits Point, the real Willits Point, which is Fort Totten in Bayside. Thanks, Mitch. With the mouth of Flushing Bay. This is not a point at all. And that's my point. Mill Willits Point, to call this area Willits Point, is a real misnomer. It gets its name from Willits Point Boulevard. Why Willits Point Boulevard? There was a family named Willits who owned the land where Fort Totten is now, and that was their farm. And so Willits Point Boulevard connected the mouth of Flushing Bay with the entrance to Little Neck Bay, which is where Fort Totten is. And that was in the 19th century. The name of Willits Point, Willits, the Willits people sold their farm to the government at the time of the Civil War to build Fort Totten and Willits Point has been known as Fort Totten ever since. But Willits Point Boulevard still exists, although it's been chopped up into three parts. One part is down here, then it runs into the Whitestone Expressway, which Moses built for the Second World's Fair, and that part is missing. And then it picks up again on the other side of the Whitestone Expressway and meanders through as a, as a private street with a lot of houses and some stores, Flushing and Whitestone, and then it's stopped by another Moses Street uh, highway called the Cross Island Parkway. And then it picks up at the very end and it goes into Fort Totten. So Willis Point Boulevard still exists, but it's in three parts. In the, 18, in the 1830s, it was only in one part. It connected the mouth of Flushing Bay to Fort Totten, effectively, to the entrance to Little Neck Bay. During the World's Fair, this was the only part of what became Flushing Meadow Park that did not fall into public hands. You can hear me, I guess? Wonderful. This was the staging area for the construction that led to the creation of Flushing Meadow Park. So the big construction stuff had bought lots here so that they could you know, leave their trucks and their construction equipment here in this triangle. And this is the one triangle that's in private hands. Everything else around here is part of Flushing Meadow Park, including the stadium. But this triangle here, which goes up to, uh, which goes on a diagonal up to Northern Boulevard, which is up there, and then on the side of uh, the new city field, it's a triangle they meet, and the uh, hypotenuse is this, and the short side is at Northern Boulevard, and the long side is along 126th Street, which I think goes along uh, the stadium. So that triangle, that Willits Point triangle, is the land that's been in, the, in contention for an urban renewal project. And the city is trying to get a hold of all of the land. They've moved a lot of people out with assistance already. You can see most of these chop shops. So after World War II, particularly all the chop shops moved in. Most people were driving, particularly in Queens, and this became a cheap place to get your automobile work done. And it created, and then after immigration exploded in 1965, this became a primary source of jobs for the people who lived in, in Corona and, and, and Hispanic people over here, and they worked in this area. So you see that a few businesses still are open. They have not have found the place to move yet, or they haven't been subsidized by the city to move. So it's still going on.
if the Queens Museum carries enough insurance for us to continue this way. <laughs> City street, right? Don't anybody be confused. This is a mapped street in the city of New York. It has not been different than this, I don't know, for the last 20 years in the winter time, maybe longer. The city has never cleaned up these streets. It has never patched the potholes, and in fact- And more than that, it has, these have no sewers here. There is no so sewers. So that whatever mess is created by these jobs goes right into Flushing Bay. And several people who own the businesses around here, when they patch holes in the road themselves, were fine. Right. And so the people um, here, the so businesses here pay taxes, but they're not getting all the services that they should get. So this has been a real morass uh, politically, because the city now wants them out. And they say, no, but you've not given us services, you've not fixed the area. So where does the industrial effluvia go? Where's the what? It really is just. Where do they get rid of all their industrial waste, though? What do, you, what do, you <laughs> do they pay it goes for it right to be into carted? the ground. Oh. Or some of it's carted away. Okay. I mean, the, the solid stuff is carted away, but anything liquid, you know, if they're spilling oil, it goes right into the ground. Uh, more importantly, nobody has a bathroom. Yep. Right? There's what? no sewer system. Well, there's the one guy who lives yeah. here. He has a oh. Yeah, yeah, but for most of these businesses, if you have a place, then you've got a tank, right? Or a porta potty or something like that, because there is no sewer system to hook up to. Would you, would there be running, is there run any, like, there's no sinks either? There's no, there's no oh. services. Why not? The EP provides no services over here. Why now, no a little services? bit of his, history on the subway. The subway didn't come through here until the 20th century. Up until 1917, the last stop was 103rd Street in Corona. In the 20s, it was extended to here, above ground, like you can see, and the yards were also built here. The name of the stop here was Willits Point Boulevard, and Willits Point Boulevard existed all the way to Fort Totten at that point. The Willits Point Boulevard station was a local station right here. Now it's an express station further down. The, the location of the station was not changed until the World's Fair. And then the name of the station was not Willits Point Boulevard, it was World's Fair for 1930 and 1940. And then Flushing Meadow Park, not Willits Point at all. That didn't come back until later. That, this station that you probably got out this morning was probably has the, the most names of any station in the whole sub subway system or elevated train system. So, that's, here is where the station was originally. It's moved about a third of a mile down to where you can't, where you, if you took the subway in, that's where you got out and that's where we'll go, we're going back where we walked down the stairs. That is now the Willits Point Boulevard on small signs, but big signs that says, that's Willits Point. But my point is that this is not a point. <laughs> And as a geographer, it insults me, and I've written to the Transit Authority about this, but they refuse to change it because all the planners and politicians now call this Willits Point, which is nonsense. This is not a point. Can I ask whoever the council member is here? Have they been involved in this discussion there about are services? There are really two council members here. Julissa Julis Ferrara is the council member on that side, and Peter Kuh in Flushing is the council member on this side. And there is mass disagreement. Julissa Ferrara, well, I'll talk about that a little bit later. <laughs> and then come out further up and we walk alongside City Field. Who's been in City Field? Oh, yeah, it's a nice stadium. First year of the second World Sport, 1963. Mets were already here playing in the polo grounds. They got the new stadium, Shea Stadium, which was on that side of this area here. It's all now you're on Public Park. This is all Public Park. This was part of the uh, of the uh, Flushing Meadow Park. But they allowed the stadiums here because that's kind of a recreational use. So the stadiums were built here. Shea Stadium was over there, and parking was over here. Then they built. Was it five years ago? They built City Field with the help of Citibank. 
and because that was privately built rather than publicly built, um, this land is now kind of leased to Cityfield and the Mets. They kind of control what happens on this land. Whereas with Shea Stadium, the city retained control of what has, what's happened on this land. The Wilpons, who own the Mets, have a great interest in what happens here because they will profit from what, what happens to this land. As will they hopefully profit from what happens on that land. Well, I don't know about hopefully, but... <laughs> Pardon me? Um, I mean, what? <laughs> I said, I don't know about hopefully. <laughs> it depends on who you are. I don't know that. In 2007, which is now eight years ago, hmm. Bloomberg, who did a lot of good things for the city, but also played the same game that so many New York City mayors do, particularly if they're Republican, they get into real estate and they help, they, they try to get the big real estate people to do big things and hopefully there are some side benefits for the general public. And so one of the tough things about where we just were is that that was designated an urban renewal site in 2008. The roads have been like that for much longer than that. Yes. A designation that a neighborhood is one that should be renewed is actually a confirmation by city council that the area is so blighted that it should be cleared out and we should start over, right? And that is something that was found to be constitutional in 1954. It was found to be constitutional not because of what happens next, but because of the menace of blight, right? This theory that that kind of condition is gonna spread to over here, just like the flu, right? But actually that's a manufactured condition. And it was a condition that in 2008, it was very easy for people to say, whoa, that is terrible. There are no sewers, right? It does look like that after it snows. There is, there, nobody fills the potholes, but actually a lot of the things that make the neighborhood feel like a place where, wow, let's throw our hands up and start over. Um, are things that the city itself has done and not the things that the people who live, who, well, the person who lives here, but mostly the people who work here have done to the neighborhood. But they're the ones who are actually being displaced as a result of having the neighborhood be called blighted and having that, that area be designated as an urban renewal area. I wasn't within earshot when you guys were talking about relocation, but just to give a little bit of context, there are phases to the relocation. Um, the the people who are running their businesses here now all have leases from the city. They no longer have title to their properties. All of their properties have been taken through eminent domain. Some of the properties have already been moved out. There was a lawsuit that was brought by a group of the businesses here and they tried to settle by having the, um, the city relocate them together and create a cooperative space where they could at least manufacture the conditions here where people are working side by side, they, it, that part of the settlement failed. So that is not happening. They are getting some individual relocation assistance but the group isn't moving all together. And then there's a second phase of the relocation. Those folks are still here. They're leasing from the city. 